today's CEO book club training, I'm really excited to bring in, I like to call her Dr. Nadia. I was just telling her about how it feels like she's like a doctor personality, but Dr. Nadia Zaksimbaya, I know I completely butchered it, is going to be talking to us about her reinvention academy and her book. Last month, we had an opportunity to dig into her book as well as watch her YouTube video. And the reason why I wanted to invite her as our guest author for this book club is because I really love how she took such a broad approach to looking at reinvention through big companies. Because of this, I think we can learn a lot of lessons that could be adapted to us small business owners, especially from the lens of leadership. I want to just give you a sense of her background. Ventures Magazine calls her the reinvention guru. TEDx Navasink calls her the queen of reinvention. She is a scientist, an entrepreneur, an author specializing in the resilience and reinvention. As a consultant, Nadia helps companies like Coca-Cola, Cisco, L'Oreal Group, and many, many more to reinvent their products, leadership practices, and business models to really meet the growing demands and prepare for incoming disruptions. As a speaker, she's delivered keynotes to over 100,000 executives for TEDx Talks. And as an author, she's also wrote several award-winning books, most recently, The Chief Reinvention Officer Handbook on How to Thrive in Chaos, which we read last month. I invited her to come in today to really lead us through some discussion on really the biggest opportunities for us as small business owners, specifically service-based coaches, consultants, on really how can we really start to adapt and reinvent ourselves with the ever accelerating change and disruption that especially right now is putting a lot of pressure on big companies and small business owners like us. We also know that right now, social media, right? Big social media companies like Facebook, formerly known as Facebook, to Meta, Twitter, Instagram, they are all undergoing some significant changes from a technology perspective to really advance how we connect, how we drive change, how we create community. And there's a huge opportunity for us as businesses to either thrive or be destroyed with these disruptions. And so thank you for joining us today. I am so thrilled to have you here. Tell us, where are you tuning in from? Where are you joining us from? Thank you so much for having me, Elizabeth. I am in Columbus, Ohio, here in the U.S., but I was born in the Soviet Union and I spent almost 10 years living in Europe, in Slovenia. So I have this, you know, Central Asia, Europe, U.S. continuum that I continue to fly through and work in during the year. Awesome. Share with us, what really inspired you to write this book on the reinvention? Because I know when you and I were talking, you mentioned that you came from the world of academia. So what really inspired you to go from academia to entrepreneurship and now being a speaker consultant, helping big companies, but also small business owners like myself? Yeah, it's always an accident. I was a Coca-Cola chaired professor of strategy in the executive education business school. So it's a lot of fancy work to say that I had a very fancy position. And um, a student in my class who was a CEO of a rather large agriculture company said, you speak so well, I almost believe you, but you have never worked in business. So how about you actually go and do something in business and then your words will have so much power. He was our first client in 2007. That was 15 years ago in June. Wow. And that's how our consulting business was born. And we started the agency in 2014 specifically to help companies in a challenging situation to figure out how to exit it. And we didn't have a good name for it. We didn't have a website. We didn't have a business card. We didn't have anything. Even our name is a funny thing. My husband's last name starts with J and mine was Z. We called it Jay-Z Consulting. And then <laughs> like, 
Um, maybe we shouldn't call it by the Jay-Z name of the famous Z- rapper. The American rapper. <laughs> yeah. So maybe uh, having a consulting, a serious consulting company with the name of American rapper, maybe it's not the best idea, but it didn't even cross our mind. So that's how unprepared we were. It was a complete accident. And from 2007 to 2014, our consulting business was word of mouth only. We were always passed on from a CEO to CEO, from the board to the board. And in 2014, we could no longer accept new clients. We had more work around crisis and reinvention that we could possibly handle. So again, it was a client who pushed us, who said, well, if you cannot come fix our problem, can you teach us how to do it? Can, do you have a method? Do you have tools? Do you have anything you can teach us? And we started this new venture called Reinvention Academy for that reason, that somebody can learn instead of us doing uh, the heavy lifting, the company itself can do a lot of things. So the word reinvention emerges then. And we, we didn't have a word. We were just fixers. We never did anything they show in movies. So not um, no illegal activities, no <laughs> killing people, none of that that they show in movies. It's more looking at the financials, looking at operations, looking at soft issues and figuring out how can we recover here and what can we recover. From there on, we built now a global community of thousands and thousands of practitioners who get certified as our, um, with our reinvention tools and have a license to use it all around the world. We now have three layers of certifications from a foundational level to advanced level to the mastery level. We have an association of reinvention professionals and it's now this massive thing. But when we started, it was just an accident. Oh my goodness. And I know that you and I talked about that because I, I talked about how I started my journey as an entrepreneur by accident as well, just trying to solve and fix problems. I was a consultant in corporate myself and a co-founder messaged me and said, I'm really desperate. Can you help? And then of course I said, how could I just not jump on a call? And that's how I started as well. So it sounds like I just, if you're watching this, one of the things that really bonded over Nadia and myself was that really the heart of academia myself, I was sharing with her that I had started a PhD program to really start my doctorate. And then I ended up putting that in pause as I built my business because it's just so much, right? And I just really never really went back. So we really bonded over just the love of teaching and knowledge and models and passing that on to others and then accidental entrepreneur as part of our journey to really be problem finders and problem solvers, fixers as well. So thank you for being here. I want to just ask you one last question before I I give you the ball because you and I had talked about this and why do you think small business owners really need to think about reinvention for their business? I often find that innovation or reinventing themselves a lot of small business owners don't really even want to think about or don't even want to imagine. They don't think it's applicable to them. Mm-hmm. Why do you think based on your experience working with Fortune 500 companies all the way to other successful small business owners, why do you think they should care and pay attention to reinvention and most importantly, leadership in reinventing them? We'll cover some of it with data today as I will share some data on the speed of change. The reality today is that it's always something you will be disrupted all the time. You will be challenged nonstop. It's not a thing that passes on and then things normalize. This idea that this economic crisis will pass and will normalize. So this COVID crisis will pass and then will normalize. So then a war will be over and then we will have a peaceful life or the competitor will somehow magically disappear and I'll have a peaceful life it just doesn't this is not the era in which we live anymore Mm -hmm. we have no evidence that there will be any kind of predictability and certainty for decades to come which means reinvention is something that you do on a regular basis the way you take a shower it's not something you do once in a blue moon like producing a wedding you assuming Most of us don't marry more than a couple of times in a lifetime, maybe once or maybe two or three, but not really more often than that. So it's not like putting together this massive wedding. It's more like 
taking a shower. If I don't wash myself on a regular basis, I begin to stink. And if I don't wash my company, my products, my pricing, my branding, my processes, if I don't wash them off and make sure that they're shiny and clean and working properly, they begin to stink as well. So reinvention becomes a survival tool. And today it becomes a source of really unique competitive advantage because you're constantly ahead of the curve. You are not reactive. You are proactively addressing incoming disruptions and therefore you are creating a source of advantage and a leadership on the marketplace that makes you internally stable. Maybe the external world is crazy, but inner world, the way you feel and your team feels and your customers feel, uh, you have that sense of uh, calm and stability and kind of certainty that most uh, people around you may not have. So that's my take on reinvention, but I'll say uh, quite a bit more in terms of data and hopefully that will, will apply to you and will drive you forward. I love what you said there, which is when you stay on top of reinvention, you're very proactive, you're proactive enough that you can remain calm and grounded in sort of the midst of chaos and the, the market changing. And I think that's just so powerful because many times as a small business owner, we can get thrown off by disruptions and innovation and then we lose our grounding and we start to make decisions that are very reactive and coming from a sense of scarcity versus being on top of it and feeling grounded like, yep, this is where we're headed. I love what you said there about the sense of calmness that comes with that. And it's that's like the calmness goal. of the storm, right? Yeah, that's the goal for me is to provide a source of resilience and uh, a feeling of calm and peace at the time where it feels almost idealistic and impossible to do so. I think we all can have a lot of common peace. I think it's very, very possible, but it will not come from the outside. We no longer can hope that somebody out there will suddenly make our world predictable and certain and clear. There's no evidence for that. Great. Just a couple of things in terms of logistics. I'm going to go ahead and you know pass this over to you. I know that you provided this community with some amazing resources, and we're going to go ahead and tag that and include that in our post here shortly. So they'll have that that you sent over, including how to connect with you as well as your community. And so with that, I'm going to go ahead and pin you to here. I'll still be here, but the show is all yours. So go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much. And of course, I'll ask you to participate in the chat so that you can mimic for our listeners uh, that may be watching this in a replay. Some of the questions I'm asking because this is really meant to be self-reflective. And I always repeat to everyone, this myth that we learn from experience is simply not true. We don't learn from experience. If we learned from experience, we would never repeat the same mistake because once the experience happened, automatically you learn, but you don't. You learn from reflecting on your experience. And unless you take the reflection and pull out the learnings, nothing happens. So I ask you to be active in this time that we spent together. And I will be kind of teasing you a little bit with my questions and asking you to make some guesses. So have a pen and a and paper ready to make those guesses that would work very, very well. And of course, we do hope that you already grabbed the copy of the Chief Reinvention Officer Handbook. If not, we'll have the 85-page preview ready for you so you can grab that copy as well and be able to at least get a little sense of the tools that we offer and so on. So since this is a community that is in consulting, coaching, service type of industry, I specifically wanted to speak about trends that are really turning our industry upside down. I will try to share some variations of what it may mean for you specifically and in our community, we have solopreneurs, mass number of solopreneurs, people who work with massive organizations, but also people who work with nonprofits, people who work with churches, people who work with individuals and coaching individuals, very niche kind of coaches in health, in personal finance and so on. 
So this trends apply to them and we've now tested them with about two to three thousand consultants, coaches, trainers all around the world. I hope they will resonate with you as well. And I'll try to be rather uh, precise, but also rather swift as we move from trend to trend. But before I say anything about the trends, I always love, love, love to create a learning opportunity early on, because my job is to make sure that I really, really transparent and clear showing you what is changing in consulting, coaching, training industry, what is changing this year, but also what's changing this decade. And I want to give you some ideas um, of what can be done to address these trends and these disruptions and how others are doing the management of these disruptions. To start us off with something super, super valuable that you can use today, even if you don't finish watching this and you just watch the first 10 minutes, this is something you can use right now by the end of the first 10 minutes, a simple, easy reinvention hack that you can use immediately. And it has to do with the way we are working with our clients and most of our clients you dealing with some sort of reinvention, some sort of change, whether you are working with individuals, groups, communities, companies, everyone is essentially in consulting, coaching, training industries, trying to foster a reinvention, big or small, very incremental or very radical, doesn't matter. And of course, most of our clients are afraid of change. They are resisting change. They are creating a lot of barriers to change. And I, that's why I love this cartoon that is all about let's not risk anything and let's just play it safe and die in the process because that's essentially what most of our clients experience. They just want to play it safe and they don't want to risk. They are like, I don't want to go there. And their way to solve this issue is to use a trick. I call a fail party, but you also can do it one-on-one -on -one in individual coaching. And it comes back in with science. So most people tend to think that the way to overcome fear is to show stories of success. So look, this one was successful overcoming this problem and this one and this one. Look at this case and this case and this best practice. How amazing it is. Or when we are in an organizational setting and we are brainstorming ideas of how we can improve things, there is a lot of beliefs and myth that we should show examples of our competitors and best practices and say, here are some examples of what we could do. Research surprisingly shows that doesn't work. And if we want to promote change and increase the quality of brainstorming at the same time reduce the level of fear resistance and inertia sharing failures works much better so having a little fail party whether it's one-on-one -on -one or in a group and sharing our embarrassing moments and our failures things that didn't work out what we learned from them has scientifically proven increased the quality of results so Kellogg school of management recently did experiments where one group of participants were sharing inspirational best practices before brainstorming. Another group of participants was sharing embarrassments and failures before brainstorming. The second group produced 26% more ideas. The quality of those ideas was also higher. So we know from tons of evidence that the better part is to normalize failure and bring down the heat uh, I need to produce an amazing idea uh, so sharing the failures starting with that normalizing failure actually improves the chances of successful reinvention and helps us build trust with our community and build trust with our overall audience in the process. I hope you promise to try it out. You're welcome to put in the comments if there will be uh, a chance to put the comments if you're watching in replay. But I hope you try this out because this is a very, very simple hack that you can use. And one of our community members, she's a small business consultant. Her name is Sonia DiMaolo and she's in Canada. She immediately after hearing this hack, she said, I just tried it with my client. 
uh, for the first time and it was just an amazing hit. So I invite you to try something like this, whether you call it a fail party in Europe, they are not afraid to cuss. They call it fuck up night or fuck up hour, a fuck up minute where you are sharing what didn't work well. And this is a simple way to bring down the stress and the internal pressure we put on ourselves. And Elizabeth says, yeah, I love the idea of the failed party. So simple hacks, simple things that you can do today. I hope this get us going and you now know who I am and how I, I think I'm very, very honored you are watching this session and to get to know each other a little bit more. I have to say a few words of how I got here. Elizabeth already introduced me and helped me share my story. I am a recovering academic. I am a business owner. I have a group now of companies that I own together with my business, with my business partner and husband. But we also are investors in many different other companies where we're not active management. And I'm also a mom. My daughter is 18. She's just about to enter college. And I spent a lot of my life in activism. Opportunities have emerged in my life to bring together amazing people and do conferences and create movements around environmental issues and peace building. And that has been a very important part of my brand. And I think for consultants, coaches, trainers, building a brand around our passions, around our full lives, including our children and our partners becomes so important because it's easier to understand who is that selling you a product or service if you know their backstory. For me, for me, the important part of this story is, of course, the clients we served, but there's another part of my story that is so important, which is uh, we work a lot with our competition. And I will speak about this more today, that there's a big trend around working with our competitors, other consultants or coaches, other trainers, and we've done exactly that, working with some of the largest and most complex consulting teaching, training, coaching organizations around the world. As I mentioned in the introduction, we started Reinvention Academy seven years ago because we couldn't do any more consulting and coaching. I was a trainer for 25, more than 25 years. I started in 94. I own my own reinvention agency for 15 years with a B2B focus. But we are in a B2C reality right now with a huge effort to bring 1 billion trainings, to bring reinvention skills to 1 billion people. And that has been our big, big focus and big commitment. For me, it's important that you spend this time really focused. So I hope you turn off a lot of your distractions and we will zoom through the trends quite quickly and hopefully start uh, the dialogue also at the end with Elizabeth as she will take us through some maybe follow-up questions you have. But if you cannot hear one thing and if you cannot remember everything I say here, I hope you remember this one thing that is so important. We are in the middle of a really fundamental change, the way humanity lives, works, competes, and thrives. And the consulting, coaching, training world is rapidly dividing into two extremes, those who profit from this transformation and those who are left behind. It's time for us to produce new offers, new niches. We need to figure out a different way to show up in the world. And this is what I call reinvention. So my job today is to help you understand what's happening in the world and how can you utilize this transformation for your competitive advantage and not get crushed by this massive change that is happening around the world. So what do I mean? Trend number one that I want to highlight is that essentially your client's world is upside down. It's fundamentally different. And many people think that when I say this, I mean COVID or whatever else, but I am not speaking about COVID. COVID is a little symptom of a deeper problem. And you most likely already heard this term called VUCA world, the world that is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. This term originally was actually designed in the 80s and became very popular in early 2000s, about 20 years ago. 
during the uh, war period in Iraq because it was used by military uh, to describe the new reality in which they live, extreme volatility, extreme uncertainty, extreme complexity, and massive ambiguity. And that's what is happening for our clients. They're looking through a completely different reality and it has to do with the lens of business cycles. If you read the book in the book club last month, you remember the first chapter, I go quite deeply into research on business cycles because that's the essence snapshot that shows, that shows you the temperature of the world, of your client's base, what's happening with them. And what's happening with them is the speed of changes accelerate. So if you think about the overall cycles that were happening in the past and how often do I need to start a new growth cycle, a new growth cycle in small business, how often do I need to start it? In the past, it was rather rarely a typical business model cycle in the 20th century. What does it mean? How long can I do the same thing and still make money? That's essentially what a business cycle is. How long can I do about the same thing and still keep making money? In the past, the average life cycle of a typical business model was about 75 years, which meant that I could do the same thing for decades and zero need to reinvent. So if I was talking to you in 1960s, 1970s, even 1980s, no need for reinvention. There is nothing to discuss here. The problem showed up, however, that in about late 1980s, early 1990s, that business cycle shifted and shrunk and for most companies became much, much shorter. So already in the late 1980s, early 1990s, and all the way through about 2001, 2005, the average life cycle of a typical business model became 15 years. Suddenly, I have 30 or 40 years to reinvent. I only have 7, 10 years until it's time to jump the curve and get to the new cycle. And that number, of course, is not stopping here. So the question I have for you, guess what is the number right now? What's the average business model cycle right now in 2022, if you were to guess. And I see some numbers, three years. Maybe it's three years, maybe it's something else. And most of the time when I ask people, they give me many answers from few months to few years, all the way up to maybe five, seven, 10. The reality, of course, all of you are correct because we are estimating these numbers. We are doing research on these numbers every two years. And we see that for different industries is slightly different, but the speed overall is accelerating. In 2020, 16% of companies reported that they need to reinvent every year or less to survive and thrive, every year or less. And consulting business is among these people. So most of your competitors, if they want to survive or thrive, they need to reinvent very, very quickly. In consulting business, I would assume it's about every six months right now. For many fast-moving consumer goods, for many in the retail and close to consumers, this is every two to three years. That's the majority, about 44%. And then for the manufacturing companies, supply chain, that's every 28%. And only the extractive industries, mining, metals, oils, have a luxury of having slightly longer cycles where they need to reinvent every six to 10 years. But for our industry and for most of our clients, because as consultants, coaches, trainers, we mainly serve this 60% of people who reinvent very, very quickly. I need to offer something that is relevant for their volatile and fast moving world. And in that sense, the median that we found in 2020, which is six right now across all industries, it's actually cut in half because in the in the research that we see, we it's very, very clear. You cannot reinvent when you're already in decline, when you're already losing clients, when you're already losing attention and budgets and so on. You need to reinvent proactively. That means you don't have six years. You have about half of the cycle and that's a whole new ball game. And most companies are not surviving. So we see that in the Fortune 500 companies that are disappearing, but also in other smaller companies that are disappearing as well. And the prediction is that by 2027, 
about half of all standards in Poor 500 will be off the list. So even the titans of business, the largest companies are not able to survive, let alone small business owners. The statistics are very, very clear. 75% of all transformations fail. So we have some work to do. We have a challenge on our hands where we have to learn how to reinvent better or become completely irrelevant. And that's where the trend number one comes in. We can no longer just do a little bit and do theoretical understanding. We need constant adaptation and everything we do, whether it's our marketing and sales part of our business or product part of our business or pricing and branding part of our business, we need to figure out how to adapt on a regular basis, not to wait until the disruption comes. How can you do that? You can do that by using new tools. And this is another one of our certified reinvention practitioners. Gary Graham is in South Africa, and he works with many small businesses and nonprofits. That's his customer base. He's a consultant to small business, and he uses new tools. Those new tools are essentially all about this new adaptive world. Because our client's world is upside down and they're asking us, can you give me a tool that is allowing you to be more adaptive, that is allowing me to be more flexible and agile? What can you show me? And having those tools allowed Gary to land new contracts and new retainer relationships that really helps him with his cash flow as South Africa continues to be a very volatile country with a very, very high level of unemployment and other volatility. Trend number one, your client's world is upside down, moving from a cycle of seven to 75 to a cycle of six, which means we as consultants, coaches, and trainers need to help them make this transition and make it easy. So the question I ask for you, how good are you today in preparing your clients for this world? How good are you today in turning the VUCA reality into new clients, offers, and contracts? And I want you to give yourself a fair assessment. Are you excellent? Are you good or could be better? Or you're really not there yet? And if you are answering two or three, the first invitation I have for you is start thinking through the perspective of your clients and imagine products and services that are specifically designed for the volatile and uncertain world that helps your client make sense of that world and be more adaptive and more ready for any kind of disruption in that world. Trend number two that I want to share is this idea that the nature of consultancy, of coaching, of training is sharing and changes, is changing because nobody knows the answer. And what do I mean by that? It, I mean that most of our history of consulting, coaching, even uh, special coaching training, it was all about becoming, being the expert. You come in as an expert. You come in as a content subject matter expert. So you know the answer. And in today's world, when things are going so fast and the volatility makes it very hard to have a ready-made answer that you take off the shelf and you just provide it. Here's the best practice. Here's a tool. Here's the answer. Today, it's no longer about giving the answer. It's about offering a way to discover your own answer. And that's called process consulting. That's essentially a heavy part of coaching. And it's also something we must do in training that it's no longer about the content we know in our head. We read a lot of books. We had a lot of experience. We know the answer. Nobody cares about your answer. Help me figure out my answer. And that is a whole different offer. Offering that kind of thing and also being super, super honest with ourselves on the fact that our diplomas and our regalias and whatever else makes us feel good. Nobody cares anymore. My husband keeps telling me that it's like in sports. Your game, your score is relevant today when you finish the game. Tomorrow, nobody cares. You start from zero. And it's a very hard thing for a lot of us in consulting, coaching, training industry because our CV, our brand, our knowledge, our 
certifications and everything we've done seems to be so important. So I come in as the subject matter, as an expert. But the expertise today is not in the content I know, but can I organize a process? So what does it mean specifically? It means organizing things such as kill the company exercise, which HBO uses and many of our clients use, where you are facilitating a workshop where the company participants themselves figure out what needs to be changed in the company and you are not providing that answer. You are not coming in and saying, you need to change this and do this and move here. Instead, you facilitate the exercise that engages everyone, allows everyone to find the right answer together. This particular exercise involves bringing together a diverse group of people where you divide them into groups and they compete for inventing the best way to destroy the company today. Once they do that, they suddenly themselves see every risk, every threat. They also start getting very energized about preventing those threats from happening. You don't need to work hard convincing them to change or dealing with the resistance to change and addressing inertia. It all engages. This is one of many exercises that is selling today. In the past, me as a strategy consultant, I would come in with a PowerPoint and tell you what to do. Nobody cares about the PowerPoint anymore. The request is that you facilitate an experience in which every participant discovers what's the right answer for them. This is an example of one of our graduates, Metka Glass. She used to be a corporate person like Elizabeth. To degree myself, I had three years of corporate job in mining. Metka was in Studio Moderna, and then she moved on to build her own consulting business. And it's all about building a community and a safe place where you can facilitate and co-create the answers rather than just monologuing and delivering the answer because there's no patience for that anymore. We all have been burned by fancy PowerPoint slides or by answers that are just not relevant for us. That's super far from our reality. So we don't want that. We want a way to discover our own path. So that's the second trend. Nobody really knows the right answer. So process of discovering that answer becomes much more important than content. And that would be the trend number two. And let me check with you again. Let's do a little self audit. What do you mainly offer right now? Are you mainly focusing on content, expertise, advice, training, analytical reports? Are you doing more process? This is facilitation, development support, design thinking sessions, brainstorming sessions, or do you do a bit of both? Do an honest discussion with yourself. And I see the answer in the chat, mostly one, and that is very threatening, meaning it's a dangerous place to be right now to be mostly in one. And I advise you to start thinking about the combination of one and two, because just content consulting today is becoming less and less in demand and many more of our corporate clients and small business owners as well asking for process support. They don't use the word process, but essentially that's what they're asking. Can you run a session for us? Can you do strategic planning exercise for us? Don't come in with your version of our strategy. Help us develop our own version of the strategy. That's kind of the advice. The third trend I want to talk about is the trend uh, that has to do with specialization. For longest time in consulting, in coaching, in training, having a very, very specific specialization was important. I only consult in leadership or I only coach in health and wellness or I only do financial training and financial coaching or I only do marketing. And that's a great thing. It's a great thing to be deep in one area, but it's no longer enough. Because when we talk about reinvention and in our model, we have seven pillars, but I'll talk mainly about three of them. There is anticipating change. So to help our clients deal with volatility, our clients need to be very good at anticipating change. They need to be very good at designing change and they need to be very good at implementing change. And you cannot skip any one of those, which means we need to be able to connect to other expert areas, including if we are in 
health consulting. We also need to be somewhat knowledgeable about other areas. For example, if you are specifically coaching individuals and your particular focus is health and wellness, the reality is they probably have problems with health and wellness because their mental space is not okay or their relationships are not okay, or their finances are not okay. And you can give them every wellness and health advice you can possibly give them. But if they're not solving the root cause, nothing works. And that's what I mean by specialization is that having only an eye for your own area is no longer significant and sufficient enough. It doesn't allow you to compete anymore because your competitors are going into what we call T-shaping. So you go deep, that's the depth of the T, but you also go wide. So you have a health and wellness coaching, but you also occasionally weave in auxiliary topics, including relational health, mental health, financial health, and every other forms of health, because you cannot have physical health without addressing all of those other areas. And here, I always love to see how transfer knowledge happens among other people. So Jim Merhart is certified reinvention practitioner here in the US, and his niche area was reinventing churches. And he was very good at that. And US, there's a crisis with churches uh, closing a lot because people just don't want to come anymore. He would work with a church that would lose 10% of membership each year. He would be able to reverse it into positive growth because he was so good at churches. But he realized that he can apply the same knowledge for, let's say, small and medium-sized manufacturing because it's about the same dynamic, this conservative thinking. It's been set in your ways. He transferred the knowledge from the churches to the manufacturing clients. That's what he says here in my, in the past few months, I attracted my first manufacturing client and also approached by a real estate company to assist them with leadership team reinvention. That's what you want to see. You want to see not just deep in one area, but also wide across many different areas. So in that sense, it's so important that all of us consultants, coaches, trainers start expanding our comfort zone. Finally, it's all about tools and skills is how fast are we able to upgrade ourselves, co-create new tools and new skills, because in today's world, it's exceptionally hard to keep up with the speed of change of your consultant coaching trainer. There's another tool every time. There's another challenge every time. So how do you and many of us are solopreneurs or have small teams how do you stay on top? Maybe we have a VA, maybe have a small team. How do we stay on top of it all? The most important thing is that we keep treating each disruption as a unique event and we keep spending so much energy addressing each disruption. There is some sort of transformation of COVID and it's like a whole new world for us. But the reality is that if we keep treating each disruption as a new event, we will be exhausted and overwhelmed. And we don't even have time to rest because another disruption is just on the horizon. The real thing is that if you have a set of tools that help you reinvent on a regular basis and you utilize them as a habit, you turn them into a habit, you become a musician, just like a good musician who knows how to play piano. That musician can play rock and country music and classical music and R&B, same way when you have strong resilience and reinvention skills, you are able to address any kind of disruption. Maybe it's a new competitor or maybe Facebook changed the algorithm or maybe your client changed their mind or there's something different is happening for your client that you need to change. You become a master of reinvention because you are able to address it again and again and you don't waste your time trying to figure out from scratch how to address the particular disruptions, tools and skills for driving change results are evolving so much. And we need to build a system of continuous upgrade. One of the way our clients at Nelf Insulation did it is that they started hosting regular reinvention days where they are learning tools and they are upgrading themselves on a regular basis. This is also what we do in our community. Every few months, we host a free five-day workshop called Easy Reinvention Lab, where we share new tools. Everyone comes and shares what's working. 
And this allows us to grow together and to not be killed by big consulting businesses or big brands that have more resources than us. In that sense, cooperation becomes the new survival strategy. If we are not learning how to cooperate with our competitors, with other coaches, with other consultants, it's pretty much not possible to survive right now. The volume of knowledge we need to process is so high that unless we are able to really have a community that shares best practices, that shares best failures, best failures, as we discussed at the beginning of the session, we just cannot catch up. And that's why for us, even during COVID-19, we used to, of course, meet in person all over the world. But even during COVID-19, we stayed meeting virtually specifically so that we can rapidly exchange what's going on, what's working, how can we be better quickly, how can we upgrade ourselves, and on and on and on. So being in a cooperation with your competition, this trend I often call co-opetition, combination of the word cooperation and competition, this becomes such an important part of our business that unless we come cooperate with our competitors, we simply cannot really... Um, give enough juice to the marketing efforts, sales efforts, and the actual program delivery efforts. So with that, I'll stop. I hope you can test some of our tools and you see how you can utilize some of these trends. And I know there is this resources are provided wherever this training can be found. So you can download the 85 uh, page preview of the handbook and try some of the tools I mentioned, including the two called Stellar Strategy Canvas. That was the story of Gary Graham and see maybe you can offer that to your clients. I'll stop here. This is a perfect time to have a conversation with Elizabeth to answer any questions. Thank you so much for doing that. Let me just go ahead and fix this real quick here. I, this was awesome. I got a lot of great questions that I think for the small business owners that I would just really appreciate your take on. Don't be the subject matter expert with just the content only. Shift to this process, coaching, consulting, and co-creation. Don't be deeply vertical or highly specialized. Cooperate with your competitors. What's your take from a small business owner perspective on doing that to survive and thrive, but still be able to stand out with their own competitive advantage, right? Because as a small business owners, unlike big corporations, there's limited resources, limited time. And what I, I hear you saying is don't just be known as highly specialized, but really cooperate with the competitors. Take a co-creation approach going T versus deep vertical expertise. What advice would you have to small business owners who are sitting there and a little concerned about, well, if I start doing that, how do I really differentiate, stand out and not lose my own identity or brand mm -hmm. as a small business owner? There's two things that I think stand out right now. <clears throat> One is authenticity. I think we feel it with our skin when somebody is real in front of us. Mm -hmm. And having that authenticity, <clears throat> not apologizing for who we are, mm -hmm. sharing that story as much as we can becomes a source of unique brand. Mm -hmm. There's many people who speak about strategy and change in my world. Mm -hmm. Nobody was born in Soviet Union to a family of executed grandparents and mm -hmm. turned it into a profession. And that's my story. Yeah. They have their own unique story and it's a great story. <clears throat> so it's not like my story is more tragic than theirs. So who I score? No, everyone had their own challenges and everyone had their story. But that's what makes me unique. <clears throat> I apologize. No, that's okay. Uh, so one is authenticity. Mm -hmm. And it took me a long while because I truly believe that my diplomas and books and my numbers was what I need to show. Then I started telling the stories of my daughter growing up and I sold more than I could ever sell because everyone could see themselves in me uh, in that challenge of being a parent and being a business owner. Suddenly they could trust me because I was human to them. Before I was just a robot telling them the statistics. It took me a long time to realize that showing up fully 
being able to laugh a little bit at my own mistakes, telling a lot from the messes our team creates and using the messes to share learnings from our business. That became our unique brand. Mm -hmm. That's number one, authenticity. Mm -hmm. Nobody can steal your story. Nobody. Mm -hmm. That's just, there's nobody like you. So nobody can steal your story. The second thing is uh, value-based uh, marketing, meaning that every time a potential customer touches us, they should get value out of it. Mm -hmm. Even if it's just a picture in, on Instagram, they should feel better after contacting us than they felt before. Mm -hmm. So if you continuously get value from me, I guarantee you will become my customer. And that comes in the form of email, in the form of text message or the freebie, the lead magnet that you offer, uh, the way your social media shows up, the way anything you do shows up. If I get even a speck of value touching you, not reading about value I will get when I buy from you, mm -hmm. that is not interesting. But yeah. if I got value in the moment, I slowly and slowly move towards I want more of this. I want more of this. I want more of this. So I think right now, two things that help us stand out and differentiate ourselves is authenticity and value-based marketing. I love that because even if you're in, I love what you said here, competition, right? Yes. Just be, being comfortable with being authentic and vulnerable is really hard for a lot of individuals, let alone small business owners or companies. So the more that you can step into that strength is what I'm hearing you say, then the more you're able to connect with your audience in a way that's really unique, because I love what you said, no one can steal your story. It's great. One of the questions that I'm sure some of my small business owners are going to be thinking about as you're talking about this idea of co-creation and being really process focused and almost like an integrator of a little bit of here and there. Let's talk a little bit about ROI or return on investment. How can you claim credit for that? What does that start to look like for coaches, consultants, or service providers in your experience that are in the space that are reinventing themselves to thrive? How are they demonstrating you know, that ROI to clients that maybe previously saw value only at hiring that highly deeply expert that knew that subject matter expert. I use a lot of data. So even the numbers I showed you today, 75% of all efforts to transform fail. Mm -hmm. So clearly something is not working. And this number has been around for about 20 years. It just actually got worse. It used to be 74. Wow. In the 90s and then 2010, it was 70. So we actually got worse. Clearly, we're not that good at integrating <laughs> and facilitating change. Whatever we're telling ourselves, we're really not good. Mm -hmm. And if you think about a typical change program, you could put a dollar amount next to it or yen amount or whatever, euro amount next to it. And you can say if your company's budget for transformation was, even if you're in small business sphere and it's $10,000, Actually, most likely, statistically speaking, 75% of that will go to trash. It will not provide anything. The value, the ROI of my work is to making sure that you are in that 25% where nothing is wasted. And that's what I provide for you. I use a lot of data-driven selling in that moment. In that moment, I use a lot of data that shows, hey, it's just not an automatic tool. And that's why... Agile management and Scrum and project management, all of those skills are highly needed right now because I think business is finally ready to admit that implementation doesn't happen on its own. It used to be a myth that you just need a great idea. And the moment you grab that idea by the tail, it will implement itself. No, it won't. I'm sorry, it won't. Nothing will happen on its own. And somebody needs to make sure it's happening. It's very, very, very skill to be the usher and the midwife of the new version of the company or new product or new process. So I usually use the data that I showed today on how few companies are good at change, what it typically means that typically about 75% of all of your budgets that you're putting towards transformation will be completely wasted. Compared to that, my services are much cheaper. 
Yeah. I love that. I'm just going to break it down. And based on what you said to maybe the average small business owner, what I hear you saying is look at how your industry is being wasteful, right? With investments, whether it's through your clients directly or other companies or small businesses that you're supporting, where are they being wasteful? And how do you go in with data or insight to really position yourself to that, in your case, the 25% that are not being wasteful, or maybe in other industry, the 5% that are doing well and really connect that dot there in order to demonstrate that value. Yeah, we went as far as yeah. we calculated, we looked at the number of meetings and calculated the salaries of people wow. sitting in the meeting in their time and said, hey, in the last year, you spent this many minutes in meetings for the total of salary in waste of this much. Mm -hmm. Nothing came out of those meetings. We yeah. can cut that in half. Mm -hmm. So I we went as far as Literally, most companies, once you sign an NDA, will give you a chance to see their meeting minutes and who sits there and approximate salaries possible to find. So you're like, on average, a typical meeting is just a waste of this much. You had 20 of them in the last six months. This is what will be saving you. So we go into creative ways to materialize and kind of make it very real, very, very concrete. And uh, sometimes it's a loss of employees. So there's a lot of data that an average replacement of employees about six months salary from losing the productivity to time that you spend on training and on and on and on. It's about six months of salary. If we can keep two employees this year for you, that's one full year salary for one person this is cheaper than me. <laughs> so yeah. there are many, many pieces of data that we use to make a case, even to a business owner that has maybe 10, 15, 20 employees. Yeah, I, yeah, I can see that. That's great. So I, I think that's really important for people to see that it's up to you to really look at what the industry is, where is the waste, where is it not working, and then really making the case and connecting the dots back to being associated with that 1%, that 25% that is not wasteful, that is working and really creating value there so that people... You, your clients can really see how you're different and what that value is. And so Claire, uh, let me just give you a very, very quick, quick tip. Yeah. We actually do a long training on this and it's not my idea. It's idea by a wonderful online marketer, Amy Proterfield. Mm -hmm. And she gave me an idea and then we developed it further that every time you are approaching a potential client, you assume that the path or the gap between your offer and their problem is obvious mm -hmm. that there is you know I have a problem and you as a consultant coach trainer like I'm a perfect solution for your problem yeah. you think it's obvious mm -hmm. but for your client most likely this bridge is invisible mm -hmm. and you need to make it very visible for them very visible and to make it visible there's three things that you need to hit three one you need to answer the question, what should my client know? What should my client know to make that bridge visible? Mm -hmm. So they need to know that I exist. They need to know what offer I have, how much that offer is, what is included, and maybe some other pieces of data, maybe statistics of some sort. Mm -hmm. But knowing is far from being enough to make a purchase. Number two, what should my client feel? Mm -hmm. Maybe they need to feel inspiration. Maybe they need to feel fear, fear that my business will destroy itself. Mm -hmm. Maybe they need to feel urgency. Maybe they need to feel something else. But you need to figure out what they need to feel and how you can deliver that feeling to them. Finally, you need to also think about their mindset, their beliefs. What should my client believe? For example, they need to believe that I am capable so how do I deliver that? Maybe testimonials, maybe something else, but I need to help them believe it's an act of faith. It's different from feeling or thinking. So you need to be a little bit more disciplined as you're approaching the client, preparing that invisible bridge and making it visible. Mm -hmm. That's a great, that's a great way to break, uh, break it down. I call it, you've got to lay out the breadcrumbs that they can kind of pick up and go without it being too overwhelming. So I really like that invisible bridge and making sure you have the no factor, the like, the no factor, the feel back factor and the belief 
on top of the mindset piece yeah. tackled in that. As we wrap up, last question for you, because we're talking to small business owners who could be a solopreneur to maybe a team of less than 10. How might they surround themselves with a community of people that I really love this? And this is how I think of what you're talking about, even though you're talking about reinvention in large companies, is practicing consistently the, the art of resiliency. That's really what my big takeaway is for small business owners. What advice might you have for small business owners that could be a small solopreneur or even a team less than 10 to keep practicing this and surrounding themselves with people that you know are in the space of reinvention and re resilience? I recently did a show. So every Thursday I host a live stream show. You can okay. watch it. It's a free show. You can watch it on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook. And I just hosted the show last Thursday. So if you're certain for it, it would be April 21st reinvention show where I shared three specific things that helped us grow 477% in 2020, then double that in 2021. And we are now four times, we have 400% this year compared to last year. So I said three specific things. Mm -hmm. I'll mention a couple of them, but not I'll find that. I'll link that to our audience as well. Yeah, too. I'll think I'll do one. And then uh, number one is we have a practice of asking our customers nonstop. We actually recently calculated, it turns out we do some sort of check in with customers every second day. Mm -hmm. So either on Facebook, or on LinkedIn, or in email, or in an interview, or in some other way, we ask some form of feedback very, very often. And that feedback forces us, forces us to reinvent because you cannot keep reading ideas from your customers and say, okay, I'll ignore it. I'll ignore it. I'll ignore it. Whether it's a customer service exit, right? Survey. Yeah. yeah so that. we ask simple things. We ask stupid things, colors, red. We were doing this when this book was coming out, we did a yeah. preview and I literally asked them blue or, or yellow button. Yeah. That's it. But it forced them to look at the cover, to say some things about the topic, to think deeply, and to be engaged with us. We ask stupid things. We ask deep things. We ask pricing things. We ask, we like nonstop bombarding them with, what do you want? How is that? Is this a good idea? What's happening in your world? What is the biggest challenge? What's the biggest victory? Like non-freaking stuff. So, and we were surprised that it's that much. We thought we were not doing enough. And we're like, no, maybe, maybe we can slow down. So that's number one is to really, you just don't ask them to complete a 30 minute survey. Nobody cares. Yeah. Ask yeah. them in a funky post, something that they do and kind of come up with five memes and make them choose a meme. But that meme means something. Mm -hmm. So ask them in a fun way. Don't ask them in a stupid old, nobody cares way. So we do memes. We, when we want to engage them, we ask them like funny things, like the best reinvention movie ever. And in their answers, we learn how they think about reinvention. And also that becomes a source of our copywriting. Mm -hmm. Because in their answer, they give me the copy, the words they use, the feelings they use. So when I don't know what to write about, I post a stupid meme and I get so many ideas for the copywriting. So that's not- I think your next business is going to have to be reinvention marketing, right? <laughs> the psychology oh, of I would love to. I would love to because I think- because so I mentioned that marketing and copywriting is Nadia's next business. I'm not super good at it yet <laughs> and because I'm forcing myself to yeah. learn. I, I'm also stumbling through a lot of things. So number one is ask a lot of things. Number two is make time. Don't hope that it will happen. Make time. So in our team, we are the team of less than 10. We are a team of seven plus three stable groups of subcontractors. So we have one group of subcontractors, which is our financial people. So our financial director and the accountant are subcontracted, but they're with us for years and years and years. So they're our team. We have a group of designers who are our subcontractors and we brainstorm them and so on. And uh, we have a few others, but our own internal team is seven people. We have a quarterly meeting that is non-negotiable and no amount of crisis and shit will allow us to move it. Mm -hmm. We take time and we always start with what was easy, what was hard, what are we reinventing? This is not a debate. Every quarter, it's a tradition. 
we all are coming ready and suggesting and debating and thinking new products, retiring, rebranding, repackaging and all of that. So unless you make that time and make it non-negotiable, it won't happen. You know, shit hits the fan. You always have something to do. So you will not well, find time. You need to make time. Those I think are some really great tips for small business owners with, you know, solopreneur all the way to a small team of less than 10 is that one, ask for constant feedback from your audience, your customers in a fun, engaging way so that you can really understand their answers, obviously increase the response rate as well as the psychology behind their answers. And then just, I'm hearing from you, like be intentional about quarterly meetings with your team to kill an idea, to kill a company, to kill whatever it is that you guys have been working on really starting to really reinvent it from almost like ground zero every quarter, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I have to tell you, when I was alone, yeah. I would set up meetings with my friend. Yeah. Because I know I won't do it for me. Yeah. I will find an excuse not to hold that meeting. So since I promised my friend and we are going through the same discussions, I come up with ideas of how to reinvent. And everyone has one friend who will have a quarterly meeting with you. So you don't need the team. You don't need a consultant for that. You can um, ask somebody in the book club to yeah. be your accountability. Well, I just made a note here that you have just inspired a fail party for the book club. So I'm like, we're going to have to like host a, a fail party every quarter or something just to talk about celebrating a failure party. So I wrote that down because I was like, that's a great idea. Yeah. So thank you so much for you know being here today. If people want to connect with you, where is the best place to find you online on social media? The best place to find me, uh, number one, is LinkedIn, and I'm active and present. You will see example of our stupid posts, even on LinkedIn, not just on <laughs> other places. Yes. And, and smart posts and deep posts. Second is our website is Learn to Reinvent, so you will be seeing that in the notes to this program. Uh, you can download a lot of resources, so in addition to the handbook, Another resource that is great for small and medium-sized business owners and also solopreneurs is a business model cards that we have. You mm -hmm. can cut them out and use them to come up with new ideas for how your business model might look. Maybe you need to change your business model. Maybe you need a subscription like the club is, or maybe you need a Robin Hood model, or maybe you need pay as you can model. Or may so those cards make you think about that. So we invite you to stop by, learn to reinvent. And just on homepage, you will see tons of free resources you can test out. I love that. Thank you so much for being here today and connect with Nadia online. And we will go ahead and post some of her contact information as well as the free resources and the link that she mentioned to her show in the show notes. And so with that, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure and good luck.